Well, good morning, everybody. Glad you'd be here to join with us as we worship the Lord at Territorial Drive Alliance Church. My name is Jacob Kokura, and I'll be leading our worship for this morning. I'd like to welcome those of you who are joining with us online, as well as here in person. Will you stand and sing with us as we begin our time of praise and worship this morning? And are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the way your sin, Jesus is calling. And have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And leave behind your regrets and mistakes and come today there's no reason to wait. For Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. For Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with precious blood of Jesus Christ. And oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing alleluia. Christ is risen. And bow down before Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Christ. And 
bear your cross as you wait for the crown and tell the world of the treasure you found. breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Whose love is mine and so much the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this amazing grace, this is unfailing love. That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain my place, that you would bear my cross, that you lay down your life, that I would be set free, oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be 
set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. We're going to play a new song for you this morning. You're welcome to join with us if you feel comfortable. It might be familiar to you already. But if you want to just sit and listen, that's okay too. Praise Him, all you sinners. Sing, oh, sing, you. We sing hallelujah, name above all, simply to speak your name is praise. Hallelujah, now and always, forever we lift your name in praise. Hallelujah, our God you reign, simply to speak your name is praise. See? 
its breath till that stone was moved for good and the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old It shall not kneel and it shall not faint By his blood and in his name In his freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected me Praise the Sing praise the Father one more time. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, praise forever to the King of kings, praise forever to the King of kings. kings. Praise God. You may be seated.
Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. While God met with Moses, the Israelites at the bottom of the mountain were getting impatient. They began to wonder, where is Moses? What has taken him so long? Is, is he still alive? The Israelites went to Moses' brother, Aaron. Make us a God to lead us, they said. We don't know what happened to Moses. So Aaron collected gold from the people and made a statue of a calf that they could worship. God saw what the people were doing and he was angry. I will destroy these people, God said. Moses said, remember the great promise you made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You promised to give them as many offspring as there are stars in the sky. You promised to bless them and give them land. So God did not destroy them. Moses went down from the mountain carrying two stone tablets on which God had written the laws. Moses got closer to the camp and saw that the people were dancing before the golden calf. So he threw down the stone tablets, smashing them at the bottom of the mountain. Then he destroyed the golden calf. The next day, Moses went back up the mountain to talk to God. These people have sinned against you, he said. Please forgive their sin. God told Moses to return to the people and lead them. When the time comes, I will punish them for their sin, God said. God sent a terrible sickness to the people because they worshiped the golden calf. God continued to meet with Moses and give him laws and instructions. One morning, Moses went up the mountain to meet with God. God came down in a cloud and he said, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God but he will not leave the guilty unpunished. Moses bowed down and worshiped God. Lord, please go with us, he said. Forgive our sin and accept us as your people. Moses acted as the people's mediator, standing for them before God. Moses could not do anything to make up for their sin, but we have a better mediator, Jesus. Jesus paid for our sin on the cross and stands for us before God. When we trust in Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Yay. Well, good morning. Welcome to Territorial Drive Alliance Church. Thank you for, for those of you joining us online, and thank you for braving the cold today. Um, it's going to be a good day. Couple things. We have a lunch after the service. It's a hot soup lunch, so that'll go well today. All of you are invited. I uh, hope you don't have any plans. We're going to go into the sanctuary and enjoy that after the service. But before we dismiss our kids, I want to call up our kids director, Rachel Hodgman, because today is the first day of her maternity leave. And we want to pray for you. Uh, how can we pray for you? Um, so, I, oh, my brain is scrambled, but, so it's twins, which some of you guys know. I know it's hard to tell that I'm even pregnant, so you probably didn't even know. <laughs> but we're early, we're really, um, we're only at 31 weeks, but it looks like it might be closer to five or six weeks left. So, so yeah, just pray for the, yeah, the identical girls, that they're born safely and um, that Shad and I can keep our heads on straight, and that the girls, Corey and Sayla, will adjust well during that time. We will do that. We want to say thank you for the way you served our kids' ministry over this last year since your last maternity leave, and let's give her a thanks for serving us so well. I'm, I'm clapping also because I'm thinking of those, all the volunteers and just how grateful we are. And now I'm on the receiving end of children's ministry with my own girls. Mm -hmm. So it's just like such an overwhelming blessing and knowing that we're continued to be blessed even while I'm on mat leave, that you guys are still caring for our girls so well. So thank you so much. So let me, let me explain to you how this is going to work. We, um, for a couple of reasons, have chosen not to hire a a maternity leave position for this year of Rachel's maternity leave. Instead, we're moving to a volunteer model, and we've had discussions with a number of our key volunteers, and they are stepping into this role with excitement, and they are excellent, excellent people. We'll be continually recruiting more. Um, I will essentially serve as the point person for that, and I'm excited about that. So 
We've got great things in store, and thank you for setting us up so well for this. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, I want to thank you for our kids' ministry. Lord, it truly is the lifeblood of a church. And I thank you that our kids are kingdom and world changers right where they are. And today, as they learn about the mediator, the incredible mediator we have in Jesus, thank you for your compassion and grace on our lives. And Lord, I pray that you'd build our church during this season. Thank you for Rachel's leadership over this last year. We pray that this season of having babies, Lord, that you would place your protection over these twins, strengthen Shad and Rachel. May this be a, um, just an incredible time of experiencing your blessing in these weeks ahead and, and in this year. So um, we submit ourselves to you. Thank you for what our kids will learn today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. And kids, you were dismissed to Kids Church. A couple other notes here. If you like meeting people, our info center is looking for more volunteers. You can talk to Connie about that or even talk to Darcy after the service and we have a schedule so that you can pick and choose how that works, but we'd love to have you join us on that. Our mailboxes are back up and functioning, so please check your mailboxes. I noticed there's probably still some Christmas cards in there and uh, you probably have been assigned a new mailbox number and your name is on there. If you don't have a mailbox, we'd love for you to have one. Take the info center card in front of you. I have one here. And check off that you would like a mailbox. That'd be great. And with the upcoming church directory being updated, if your, if your address or name has changed, or if you've noti noticed any information incorrect on, oh, this is about tax receipts. If, if your name or address has changed, or anything incorrect on last year's tax receipt, please let the church office know as they will get reprocessed soon. So income tax receipts are coming out soon. So is our, our um, church directory. So please uh, let Connie know of any changes there. Um, annual general meeting will be at the end of March. So we're encouraging our, our kids or our ministry volunteers to submit their annual reports as well as their budgets. So we're busy into that season. Okay, thanks for that. Quick update on our gym project. Our fundraising goal for the gym is continuing to progress. We have currently roughly around $80,000 committed to the gym project. Uh, you'll see that there is 133 tiles purchased on the new tile board in the foyer, and we need about 903 more of those tiles purchased to get us to our base goal, which is in that 115 range. You'll see we have a new thermometer in the foyer that gives us our ongoing total. That thermometer is the complete goal. We call it the slam dunk goal, which is all the brand new backboards and um, any contingency that comes with, with that project, with that process. So thank you for your giving. And the other really exciting thing is, I think we had announced that the Center Street Church uh, pastor's visit was off, but it is on. Next Sunday, Pastor Wayne, who started this whole thing, and Pastor, pastor Moses, both of them started this whole thing, We'll be here on site um, in our service. We're going to have a luncheon after the service next Sunday for any interested folks on sports camps. So we've already scheduled the sports camp for next, next summer, August 5 through 9. It's in our calendars. I'd encourage you to put it in your calendar to pray or to volunteer to sign up for that. And Pastor Wayne and Moses will give us some great information next week about that. Alpha. What is Alpha? Please watch. Life moves fast, doesn't it? Every day, there is so much to fit in. But do you ever stop and think? What's the point of it all? Do you ever ask yourself, is there more to life than this? Alpha is a series of sessions exploring life, faith, and meaning. It's a space to explore the big questions, to say what you think, and hear other people's points of view. 
First up, there's food, then a talk, followed by a discussion. Each talk explores a different aspect of the Christian faith. And then in the small group, you get to say exactly what you think. The aim of the talk is to spark conversation, each week unpacking a different question. There's no obligation to say anything, and there's nothing you can't say. Seriously. It's an opportunity to hear from others and contribute your own perspective in an honest, friendly and open environment. Why not try it out? Meaning of the word alpha literally is beginnings. Alpha is a basic introduction to the Christian faith where we can learn questions, answers to questions like, what is my purpose? Why did Jesus die? Is he relevant? Is God present in my loneliness? Is this all there is to life? And so the way it works, we're starting on January 22nd with a supper at 6 o'clock. We have invitations at the info center that you can give that gives the, the uh, location of, of the course and the times for the first event. January 22nd will be supper and video only. It's like the come and check out Alpha if it's for you night. Nobody has to have any obligation on that night. Come check it out. There's childcare. Um, like I said, there's supper. And then folks can decide if they want to carry on with the 11-week course, which then starts on January 29. And then we've got the schedule pretty much laid out, not exactly uh, for the following 11 weeks. I would encourage you, if you want to learn more about the Christian faith, you yourself come to Alpha. The whole goal, though, is for you to invite your friends, co-workers, neighbors, family members who are in that seeking mode and maybe wondering what is Christianity about, wanting to reconnect with church, bring them along with you. Check it out on January 22nd and then see how the Lord leads. I think, Joan, am I, am I doing okay so far? Great. Now, the next step, we have already recruited a team that will run this whole thing, and it requires a lot of volunteers. We're so excited about our meals. Gary and Mona will be taking care of our meals. They have a meal team. We have a hospitality team. We have a welcome team. We have host uh, uh, table leaders. And we want all of you to learn more about Alpha today. So we said there's a lunch. We'll simply ask all of you who have showed that you're interested in some of those areas to serve. Grab your food in the gym and then just scoot across into the fellowship hall and we will do our training. It's about two hours, I think. Joan, is that right? Ish. And then we'll be set to go for January 22nd. Okay, please talk to Joan Wentworth or myself after the service. Anything else I should add, like right now? Okay, super. Thank you. We are so excited about that. Okay, yesterday was a great day in our church. Right here, where I, I stand, Scott and Rebecca Stevenson exchanged their vows. It was just a beautiful day. Rebecca has been one of our worship team leaders for a number of years, and we won't see her up here. And she led the candlelight processional. She will now probably be leading worship at the Glenbush Mennonite Brethren Church, where uh, her husband, Scott, is a brand new pastor. And we are just so excited for how God has brought them together and equipped them for ministry in the Glenbush region. So I want to pray for them. I want to pray for our kids' ministry as we transition in our leadership. And I want to pray for God to work through, through Alpha. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, you are fully aware of every detail of our lives. And today as we talk about what, what does it look like to, to walk through challenging situations in our life, to develop coping strategies, and to see your faithfulness. Lord, even today, there's folks sitting in this room who are experiencing loss and grief. There's folks sitting in this room who have experienced relational turmoil. Um, financial challenge and crises. Thank you that you meet us right where we are. And you are the God who supplies all of our needs according to the, your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Show us, Lord, um, what you have from your word today. And Father, we want to pray for these initiatives in our church. We thank you for the sports camp initiative that, is, that has been birthed and the gym renovation project. We pray that you would supply abundantly May the visit next weekend with Pastor Wayne and Moses be truly a, 
um, uh, um, an exciting partnership as we partner with their church. Father, we commit to you Alpha, and we pray that you would open doors for the gospel to be shared with our friends, our neighbors, family members, co-workers, classmates. And uh, we look to you to create an atmosphere that would truly draw people to Jesus. We thank you for our kids' ministry leadership, and we pray you'd bless them today, and we pray that you would continue to supply for our kids' ministry. And thank you for this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, I would like to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 4. We are on the final lap in the book of Philippians. And Pastor Dirk, Pastor Nathan, and I, I think we, I can say for them that we have all just thoroughly enjoyed presenting God's Word to, do, to you. And I especially have really benefited by and enjoyed the last two Sundays. Uh, Pastor Dirk two weeks ago and then Pastor Nathan last week. That, those were just amazing talks. Thank you, men. And um, you'll be hearing more about what Nathan presented last week with regards to our vision and our mission of our church. Today, the title of my, the theme that we're in in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to the end of the book, is coping strategies. Coping strategies. By definition, I looked up online, what is a coping strategy? And this is it. An action or a series of actions or a thought process used in meeting a stressful or unpleasant situation. Have you ever had a stressful or unpleasant situation? It's, so it's that action or series of actions used in meeting a stressful, unpleasant situation, or in modifying one's reaction to a situation. Have you ever had to have your perspective modified based upon what you're facing? Coping strategies typically involve a conscious and direct approach to problems in contrast to defense mechanisms. Ever had a defense mechanism kick in and it didn't work all that great? So we're going to talk about coping strategies, and we will examine four of them that Paul expressed in Philippians chapter 4. So starting at verse 10, let me read. The first coping strategy that he exemplified here is appreciation. Number one, appreciation. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have re renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but had no, you had no opportunity to show it. So let's remember here, where is Paul? Paul is in prison in Rome for preaching the gospel. Paul has experienced all kinds of challenges, being flogged numerous times, shipwrecked, imprisoned, all kinds of things because he's a follower of Jesus and he was proclaiming Jesus. And a characteristic of a follower of Christ is that of having concern for others. Having concern for others. Paul rightfully needed concern shown toward him. He was going through some hard times, some really tough times. And the Philippian church showed that concern, and he is now saying, I so appreciated that. Concern for others is something that Jesus displayed over and over again in his earthly ministry. And what causes concern to be authentic, I can think, oh, that poor person, what they're going through. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry that they have to experience that. But concern manifests itself in reality by action, by showing action and actually helping the person. So Paul is saying, thank you for your concern. And specifically, he's saying, thank you for your financial resource ways of supporting me. And for this, he says, I have great joy. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Dirk shared with us his New Year's resolution, and I forgot to ask this week how it's going, but every day, you're going to wake up, and you're going to rejoice in the Lord. How are we doing out of 14 days? 14 times. Wow. That's a great coping strategy. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.8, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will in Christ Jesus. And Paul also said somewhere else, rejoice in the Lord always. Coping strategy number one is appreciation even in the midst of trials. Coping strategy number two, contentment. Verse 11, he says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Okay, I'll read till end of verse 12. 
I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. Twice in these verses, Paul states that he has learned contentment. I wonder if I were to ask us all, including myself, on a scale of 1 to 10, what is your level of contentment in life right now? If you were to map it out on a chart, how would you say your contentment meter is reading? It obviously wasn't automatic for Paul to be at a 10, like, I'm just content with everything, because he said twice, I have learned to be content. You don't have to learn how to grumble and complain. That comes naturally for all of us. At least it comes naturally for me. But you and I need to learn how to be content. And there's two parts of contentment in that word from the original language. Number one is to acquire understanding. Okay, so that's the learning part. And number two is to learn the secret, he says, of being content. And that key word is secret. So starting with number one, being content does not come easily or naturally. Like I said, he learned it, and I'm thinking he likely learned it through the school of hard knocks. That's how I learn stuff, mostly. And the second thing, he talked about the secret of being content. It's an idea of, so back in that time, there was a plethora of world religions that you could pick and choose from. There was altars to all kinds of gods. There was temples with all kinds of gods. And there was this, this um, idea that there was sometimes a, a secret knowledge from certain religions. And if you got the secret, you'd kind of make your way along that path. So Paul is using a, a form of, of a grammar that the people would understand. So remember, a secret, if you ever had a secret, it's something that's hidden. Okay? It's something that eventually is revealed if a friend tells you a secret. And the word Paul is saying here is that contentment is often hidden. It's often under the surface. You can't see it. But contentment is attainable. And once you catch it, once you learn the secret of being content, it changes your life. And I believe it is a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives through Jesus living inside of us that reveals this sense that I don't need anything external to be content. All I need is that which, which is inside of me. That's the living Christ, living his life inside of me. We'll get to that just in a few minutes. Paul writes these words in um, his letter to Timothy just to go along with this. He said, but godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Last week, Pastor Nathan talked about what it means to be a citizen of heaven, which is of far more value than anything that being a citizen of any country in this world could offer us. The grandeur of heaven far surpasses the grandeur that this world can offer. The writer of Hebrews said this, Hebrews 13.5, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Herein is part of the secret. Because Jesus is in you, that creates a contentment and a joy and a satisfaction and a peace unlike anything else. And so what is it that he says is of far more value than money? It's the presence of Jesus. Money can fly out of our hands like feathers in a wind, right? Jesus does not leave us. So second coping strategy is contentment. Third coping strategy is adaptability. Adaptability, on a scale of 1 to 10, how adaptable would you say you are? Circumstances of our life are like the arena of spiritual growth, one writer says. That's for Paul, that's for me. Paul learned adaptability because of changing circumstances. So in this verse, Paul presents three contrasts that provided the occasion for learning and he explained the nature of contentment. The first and the last contrast speak to physical needs in general, the stuff that you and I need in order to live. And the middle contrast, he speaks of specifically food. Again, things that we need in order to live. In these varied experiences, 
Paul learned and he displayed a spiritual equilibrium. You know what equilibrium is? It's when things remain stable when everything else around is going haywire, up and down like a roller coaster. And so what this means is he was unaffected by his external circumstances. And he's talking specifically about times where he was really, really poor. He said the word poverty. And times where his business, he was a tent maker, was going really, really well. Or lots of churches were giving to his ministry. So when there was riches. And the way to have that spiritual equilibrium is only one way. And that's through walking with Jesus. And being so completely satisfied with him who is the sufficient one. And by developing a solid material, solid theology of material things. I'm going to give you two sentences. And I got this from one of the writers I was reading this week. He says, this is the theology of material things. Sentence number one, things ultimately do not matter. Sentence number two, relationships matter. Things ultimately do not matter, even though we need them. Relationships ultimately matter. Some of the false teachers in Paul's day would have taught otherwise. They would have taught that there is a massive, massive importance on all that you could acquire. Um, I don't know when you've read the last time you've read the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. I believe there's nine Beatitudes, and I won't list them all, but a couple of them are blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And then there's a follow-up sentence that talks about what that blessing looks like. Somebody suggested, and I don't know who, that there should be a tenth beatitude based on a character quality that is found in the rest of Scripture. Here is the potential tenth beatitude. Blessed are the flexible, for they will not be bent out of shape. Blessed are the flexible, for they will not be bent out of shape. We have a prime example here in the Apostle Paul. There were times where he had nothing. And then there was times that he had overflowing resources. And it looks like he learned the secret of being content. Now, let me ask you a question. Have your goals ever been blocked? For example, you had your day all lined up and something came along and completely derailed your day. Have you ever had that happen? just an interruption or, or something, and it um, just throws you. Now, I've been thinking a lot about the Good Samaritan story lately. For some reason, it keeps coming to mind. You've all heard that story. It's about a guy who's walking down the road to uh, Jericho. He gets mugged on his way to Jericho. He's left for dead, bleeding and whatever. And other people are walking along the road, and two religious guys, one by one, comes along and sees him there, and they just keep right on trucking. Don't give him a hint of attention. Don't lift a finger at all. And then a non-religious guy, a Samaritan, comes by and sees this injured guy in the ditch. He had needs. And the passage in Luke 10, 33 says this. When this non-religious man saw him, he took pity on him. He took pity on him. Part of Christianity is having a genuine concern for our fellow man and fellow woman. And so this poor Samaritan, whose goals are now completely blocked, completely derailed, whatever whatever meeting he had in Jericho was going to be put on hold. And he proceeds to help this man on the spot, bandages him up, then he takes him to get further help and even gives some money for that. And so that is concern with action. You may have seen on the news a video surfaced recently about the death of a man in Regina at the end of December. This just really rocked me. On December 30th, a man stepped off of a city bus around 8 p.m. in Regina on a busy street. He fell as he stepped off the bus and injured himself. He lay on the sidewalk from 8 p.m. and only until next morning around 3.30 a.m. did a cyclist stop and call 911. In that time, the man died. The surveillance video from the next door business was accessed, and it showed the man waving for help and 
trying to move to create some kind of commotion. And traffic driving by over and over and over. The surveillance camera showed that the man stopped moving and waving at midnight while cars went on by. Nobody stopped. Why? Too busy? Too tired? Too afraid? Too focused on their destination? See, adaptability is a core value in Christianity, and it's required for a coping strategy when we go through trials. It's almost like we should say, Lord, I'm expecting today that there will be some interruptions in my life. And I can only meet those by the filling of your Holy Spirit through me. And the fourth coping strategy that Paul practiced, verse 13, dependency. And this is what he said. You all know this verse. You've heard it over and over again. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do all things. When did Paul find his strength through tough times? Upon whom did he find his strength through tough times? It says Jesus. Through him who gives me strength refers to the living Jesus that lives inside of him. And Paul then could accomplish all God wanted him to do with the strength that was inside of him, no matter what his external circumstances were like. Now, does this mean that I, I can really do anything? And unfortunately, this verse can be taken out of context. I, I trust that you haven't, because really it's, the context is going through difficult times and having the strength to work through that roller coaster up and down of, I have nothing and I have lots. I have nothing and I have lots. And I can, I can manage through this. So the passage really discusses material and physical needs in the day-to-day -day economic fluctuations. And God's will for Paul was not that he be wealthy all the time or that he be living in poverty all the time, but that Jesus would rule in his life all the time. If I took this verse out of context, I'm going to give you three examples. But if I said to myself, based on this verse, I can do everything, and I said, I want to be, when I grow up, a football offensive lineman, professional football offensive lineman. Well, just look at me. I like pancakes, but I don't like being a pancake. So no, I cannot do that. If I said to myself, based on this verse, I want to be a civil engineer, and then I proceed into grade 12 physics, and I get 26% on my first physics test, and I barely squeak by to the end of the semester to get a passing grade because I don't understand physics. You wouldn't want me building any buildings. I can't do that. Or if I said to myself, I want to be, uh, when I was a kid, if I said to myself, I want to grow up and be an open heart surgeon. When I pretty much faint at the sight of blood every time. I, ca I can't do those things. What Paul is saying here, he knows what it meant to face life's problems alone in the ups and downs and still see God's faithfulness through them. Now the rest of this passage, he switches from what he learned what he practiced, those core strategies, he switches to his focus on the, on the Philippian believers. Verse 14 through 16, it says this, Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. And not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Okay, I read a little further than I was planning there. But three things Paul talks about here. The support of the Philippian believers in giving to Paul's ministry was, number one, unique because there was no other Macedonian church that, that chose to give to this world-changing church-planting ministry of Paul. It was unique. Number two, Paul commends them on, on their support because it was immediate and it was consistent. So their concern played out in their faithfulness in their giving. And thirdly, Paul commended them on their gifts as their gifts were an investment. Investment in what God was doing at that time and in the future. And he said, not that I'm looking for a gift... 
but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account in verse 17. So we need to explore this a little bit more. So here's the deal. Sometimes when churches are seeking to encourage their folks to give to the church, and if, if we tend to do that too much, then we sometimes kind of get put into that camp of all the church is asking for is my money. And I don't want to be in that camp. But God owns everything you have, so really it's just returning to God, and we try to explain that. But what Paul is saying here, he's using a financial and investment example because that's the theme of the main passage here. The Philippian believers had provided for Paul's financial needs. So think about this. When you invest your money, your hard-earned money into stocks, a GIC or a TFSA, you are looking for returns on your investment. You are looking for an investment value for your money. You are looking for dividends on your return. You're not looking for an investment bust. By definition, a dividend is a reward paid to the shareholders for their investment in a company's equity. So a reward for an investment is expected. It would be useless to invest your money if you didn't expect value in return. Let me ask this question. Have you ever heard of the name Warren Buffett? Ever heard that name, Warren Buffett? The most successful investor of our day. He's 93 years old by now. I think he's worth between 120 and 150 billion dollars. He's the president or the founder of uh, uh, Berkshire Hathaway. And as a result of his investment success, he is the most successful investor of our day. He's been a master at recognizing companies that are kind of floundering or not finding their way and identifying that there's potential in those companies. And he invests in them and he buys them, buys stocks, and then they just take off and he makes a ton of money. And he knows a good investment value. And it is reported, you can Google this, that he is planning to give away 99% of his money when he dies. That's his plan. I'm not sure where it's going. If TDAC is on his list, that would be wonderful. But I, I don't know how to get on his list. One writer said the investment value of the Philippians' gift is not primarily what Paul received. And then it multiplied into all kinds of churches. That, that's investment value. When you give your money to a ministry, to a church, to Samaritan's Purse, to Operation Christmas Child, and you see the work that God does with it and people come to faith in Christ, that is investment value. That's reason enough to give your tithes and your offerings to a church. But there's something else Paul brings up here that I tend not to think about that much. And that is the dividends that the giver receives the spiritual dividends that the giver receives. And he commends them of how they supported him, but he's saying, not that I'm looking for more money. I mean, you guys have been generous, but I'm looking for what, verse 17, can we get that up, that up there again? I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. Okay, so what are these dividends? What are these blessings? So I'm going to read again verse 18, 19, which I did before. I've received full payment and even more. I'm amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They're a fragrant offering. Catch that? They're a fragrant offering, acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God, and God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. He gives two benefits for when we give. Number one, he's, God is pleased. And that's reason enough to release all that we have and give back to him. And that goes back to Romans 12 too. Our role is to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing unto God. And that's what a spiritual dividend comes from, is when we offer ourselves to God, and God becomes our greatest source of joy. The second benefit that he gives to believers is that they would experience God's provision. I want to talk about this in two ways. Number one, the spiritual dividend and the joy of giving. The joy of giving isn't mentioned in this passage that Paul writes, but he mentions, mentions it in his letter to the Corinthians, where he says, for God loves a cheerful giver. There's something that happens when we release our resources to give to those in need, like the Samaritan, to give to the church, 
like the Macedonians did, that we receive a benefit that is far beyond our comprehension because we're giving glory to God, we're offering a sacrifice to God, and there's just a satisfaction and a joy of being a faithful steward with what God gives us, as opposed to giving with obligation. And I think even Paul said somewhere, don't even give out of obligation. God can find money somewhere else. He wants the joyful givers because that's when the dividends just pour back into your account like Warren Buffett's account, except they're spiritual. And they just bring life to your soul. Now, he does say, God will meet all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So what does that mean? Does that mean that anything that I can think of that would be good for me, I'll get? No. Yeah, a friend of mine has a Porsche, and I say, well, I'd like a Porsche someday. It doesn't mean God's going to give me a Porsche. But when we are faithful to God, it says in black and white that he will meet our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Now, sometimes, remember when Paul was in poverty? How did God meet those needs? Through other people. And sometimes God's, God identifies individuals who have plenty. They see someone in need. And he essentially says and prompts us by his Holy Spirit says, why don't you give to somebody in need? and see the blessing that comes from that. So these are some of the coping strategies. I want to close with a story. And the title of this is this. We have amazing coping powers at our disposal. I want to take you back to the war. Viktor Frankl spent years in a Nazi prison camp where persons were subjected to subhuman, anti-human treatment that threatened the annihilation of decency, the worth of dignity of persons, as well as their physical well-being. Out of that experience, Viktor Frankl developed a psychotherapeutic process called logotherapy. I don't even know what that is. After that, he wrote an inspiring and insightful book entitled Man's Search for Meaning. And we're going to cover those themes in Alpha, Man's Search for Meaning. So from Frankel's death camp observations, he documented the amazing coping powers of humans to retain what he calls inner freedom. Inner freedom. He wrote, We who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts, comforting others, giving away their last pieces of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that Everything can be taken from a man but one thing. The last of the human freedoms is this. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. That's the last of the freedoms that could ever be taken away from you. And people who were in prison camps lived that. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. And that was Paul's life. He's in prison. As the book of Philippians ends, um, it's not that much longer before he eventually is executed. This is what he says as he finished off the book. Verse 21. There's not much he can give in return for the abundance that the Macedonian, uh, the Philippian church had given him to sustain him throughout his lifetime. So this is all he can give. But this is... Amazing what he's giving. He said, Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. So let me go back to the right theology of material things. Material things ultimately don't matter. What matters? Relationships. He says, Greet all the people there. The brothers who are with me, they send their greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. And guess what? Pretty soon we're going to see each other in heaven because that's what matters most. And then he says this. He just lays a gift out for them. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. There's nothing better than he could give in return for their generosity. The grace of Jesus. As we close in prayer. Prayer. Let's pray together. Three things. 
Lord, give me a contented heart. Lord, give me a joyful heart to give. And Lord, give me an abundant appreciation for your grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word once again. We thank you for Paul's life. Thank you for the authenticity of this letter to his Philippian friends. And Lord, we are so much like those Philippians. And we are so much like Paul. We need coping strategies to get through the tough times in our life. So give us that, those strategies of appreciation, of contentment, Lord, of adaptability. And Lord, use us each and every day. But Father, three things we ask. Give us a contented heart. And that contentment only comes through the living power of Jesus Christ living inside of us where we see him as so much, so much more important than anything else that is external. Secondly, give us a joyful heart by which that we would reach out and show our concern genuinely to those around us, especially those who are in need, who are fallen in a ditch and need a helping hand. And Lord, thank you that you showed to give your grace through your son Jesus. May that that thought overwhelm us just as it did these readers when they read that last statement from Paul. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we close? When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well the day when
and the face shall be sigh the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound and the lord shall descend even so Heavenly Father, um, sometimes this is really hard to say those words, that it is well when storms are crashing all around us. And yet we know, because Jesus lives inside, oh Lord, we can rely on that foundation, that spiritual, solid rock that does not shift or change or move. He never leaves, he never forsakes us. Thank you. Thank you for that gift of grace. My prayer for each one here, oh Lord, that we would, we would experience that spiritual wellness this week. Give us strength for what lies ahead. Lord, bless the food that's prepared for us. May we have sweet fellowship. Pray for your protection on each one today. Amen. So once again, I invite you to join us for lunch. Let me leave you with these words. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. God bless you.